hear you well? I'm not sure if the microphone is working. Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at this distinguished conference. Um, I'm very pleased that we have people in the audience who work themselves up at this early hour. So today I will speak and present uh, the results of my paper, which I wrote together with uh, Ilya Zaslavsky, uh, expert from the Free Russia Foundation, uh, which is titled Hybrid Analytica, Program and Expert Propaganda in Moscow, Europe and in the United States. Um, it was published uh, in August last year by the Institute of um, Modern Russia based in New York and founded by Mikhail Khodorkovsky. But this research I conducted uh, in the summer of 2018 upon the invitation of the Prague-based uh, European Values Think Tank, which is uh, one of the most strongest uh, Kremlin watches in Central Europe. And again, uh, as a previous speaker, uh, yesterday I have to make, um, not a confession, but make a disclaimer that uh, I am a former director of the Kennan Institute, which is a part of the Wilson Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I also was a Fulbright scholar with the Kennan Institute. And uh, that is why some of the things which I will talk today are based on my personal observations of things um, and cooperation programs um, in, in Russia, with Russia. So my study is based on um, previous research which was conducted by four major think tanks in the United States and in Europe, primarily Hudson Institute and its Russia Food Doctorcy Initiative, Chatham House, Atlantic Council and the Brooklyn Martin Center for um, European Studies. who doesn't really want to manage all this propaganda machine that has been created for him, that there are just sporadic actors representing various organizations, various private interests, individual oligarchs, who bring up ideas to him, and that there is a competition of ideas which uh, Putin, by the end of the day, has to endorse. The results of our research demonstrate that this is not the case, because Russia conducts um, uh, and pursues a coherent and I believe well-coordinated uh, knowledge weaponization strategy that has five interrelated components. Uh, first of all, it is uh, engagement of Kremlin-linked um, uh, Russian think tanks in the design of domestic and international communication strategies for the Putin regime. It is also the establishment of influence centers abroad uh, which operate as either think tanks, academic uh, Russian study center, Russian cultural centers, or Ruski Mir centers, various associations of Russian-speaking immigrants, etc. Also use of private, uh, typically oligarch-sponsored um, actors to promote Kremlin's interest in the West. A uh, very important conclusion, reliance on Russian intelligence in the Kremlin's information warfare strategy and infiltration of other countries through the network of agents of influence and the pursuit of a deliberate policy employing Russian state-owned and oligarch-controlled media as multipliers, promoters, and validators of Kremlin narratives and messaging. So, and combined, these efforts has led to the rise of the new phenomenon, which some of you have certainly observed, the phenomenon of putin states, a growing number of pro-Kremlin communicators, sympathizers and lobbyists, and what we call a hybrid analytica, which, is a which we define as the process of design, development and promotion of various pseudo-academic narratives by either bona fide intellectuals or duped and manipulated scholars, academic think tank experts who serve as political lobbyists in disguise, practically, and whose vested interests have been recruited through the network of the Kremlin-linked operatives with a name to make the West accommodate Vladimir Putin's international and domestic agenda. Unfortunately, you won't be able to read this slide, uh, but these infographics have made a lot of uh, waves uh, in the international scholarly community because it had been uh, retranslated by the number of media outlets. So it basically shows you how this web 
of program when um, synthesizers uh, work globally. Um, it uh, illustrates basically our research findings and depicts ties between the two group of actors. So in the first chart here in the middle where you see name of Vladimir Putin in the very center. It uh, depicts various Russian organizations and programs and oligarchs, a network of the proxy, Moscow-based think tanks, state soft power organizations and Russia's influence centers abroad. Some of the names I will mention uh, as I will present the results of my study. So collectively this group of actors is involved in the justification of the Putin regime and uh, in the design and promotion of domestic and international communication strategies for the Russian authorities. It also shows connection between the Kremlin-controlled think tanks and oligarchs with academic institutions in uh, the United States and in the European Union uh, based on various partnerships, joint academic programs and financial contributions from the Russian side, information about which is publicly available and which to a various degree we believe could inadvertently or deliberately promote Russian propaganda in the West. So these infographics basically demonstrate the scope of international institutional ties between Russian propaganda actors and Western academic institutions. And uh, we have to underscore that this chart doesn't aim to, attack, to attempt to characterize the Western institutions as entirely supportive of the Kremlin and suggest that all these connections have been maligned. Uh, quite often it is a small part on a department, on an academic unit, or even a prominent individual expert within a Western university or a think tank uh, who may appear to speak in the name of the whole institution when peddling some Kremlin sponsored uh, or supported content. Quite often, as you understand, this attempted influence is pretty nuanced, very subtle. Uh, and is carried out through a deliberately flexible approach to narratives used to the Kremlin, um, useful to the Kremlin, or uh, the result of conscious self-censorship, avoiding topics deemed sensitive by the Kremlin and its global network. Uh, first, uh, this analysis has demonstrated that there is um, a group of think tanks in Russia who have been created quite recently which are linked to the authorities and which are used as promoters of the Kremlin agenda. I believe that it is extremely important to look back in the Soviet history and to understand that the process of uh, active measures, uh, infiltration of Western academic institutions, um, even recruitment of ex Western experts, uh, Western intellectuals, writers, journalists have not started today and Russia is not doing anything new. Uh, the name of Mikhail Suslov, who led Russia's Department of Ideology within the Central Communist Party apparatus from the early 20s until his death in the late uh, 80s uh, for so many years, uh, has demonstrated that the Soviet Union has developed a very vast apparatus of uh, of the system of intellectual intellectual propaganda because under Suslov's administration there were numerous departments of writers' unions, uh, uh, actors' unions, uh, all universities, all the state-run press and even Communist Party which received parties in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe and in the United States have all been controlled by, by his department. When the Soviet Union collapsed and in the early years of independent Russia's history, uh, some Western uh, governments obtained um, archival documents from uh, KGB archives in Russia, which even demonstrated handwritten slips uh, where Westerners acknowledged receipt in cash of Russian money in support of various uh, activities sympathetic of communist ideology, etc. Uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, there was an attempt to create independent think tanks in Russia, but these efforts have been very uh, sh short in time because we know that with Putin's um, uh, arrival to power, independent think tank and independent uh, civil society organizations have been significantly curtailed as a result of the foreign agents law. And now we basically observe the existence of only state run and state uh, uh, funded think tanks which basically support uh, the party line. Yesterday, um, Edward Lucas very rightly pointed and mentioned those 10 or 20 toxic 
uh, Russian narratives, but for those of you who have not been present today, I would allow myself to repeat uh, once again several elements of Russia, so-called Russia's now conservative doctrine, which is collectively promoted by various Russian think tanks and uh, the Kremlin. So those primarily um, include the ideas of the promotion of Russia's superiority and glorification of Russia as a world uh, leading defender of true Christianity, morality, family, and other conservative values. It's a revisionism of Russian and Soviet history, whitewashing of Soviet leaders, including Stalin, denial of Moscow's responsibility for mass crimes committed against the Russian people, denial of a famine in Ukraine in 1932 and 33. Um, again, glorification of Russia's role in the world was like over Nazi Germany and silencing the role of other nations in this success. Uh, certainly, as a Ukrainian, I can't not mention the denial of Russia's responsibility for international aggression, including the war in Georgia, uh, de facto occupation of parts of Moldova, uh, illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, military aggression and occupation in Ukraine's uh, eastern territories. Uh, importantly, dehumanizing of Ukrainians, bashing Ukraine's culture and language, promoting of narratives of fascist revival and anti-Semitism in Ukraine, misrepresenting Ukraine's uh, current government uh, as a Western puppet committed to neo-Nazi ideology, discrediting Ukraine's post-Euromaidan reforms as being incompetent or driven by the West by corrupt authorities in Kiev. Again, blaming the West for the Cold War and portraying Western sanctions against Russia as a return to a morally bankrupt and unjust Cold War mentality. Uh, criticism of the West for the loss of moral uh, com uh, compass, hyperbolic focus on West's economic and political troubles, uh, support of various anti-establishment groups and radical groups, criticism of Western institutions for their seeming inability to react to new global challenges, such as international terrorism and migration, and for clearly obstruction of European integration, revival of divisive lines within Europe based on ethnicity, culture, religion, and history. So analysis of various um, publications uh, produced by Russians and can demonstrate that all these narratives are there, you don't have to look too deep to, to find them, and they are continuously repeated in the Russian media and by those experts who are invited regularly to the West as representatives either of the Russian independent uh, academic community, but as de facto communicators of the Kremlin. Uh, so, uh, I have to look a little bit chronologically and to demonstrate how these uh, newly established think tanks have been created. Uh, the key uh, institution in Russia, which is a state-run uh, institute for strategic studies, have been led by Mikhail uh, Fredkov, you know, former again, head of the Russian intelligence service. The, one of the most recent uh, think tanks, the Center for Social Conservative Politics, it is linked to Russian uh, United Russia Party, <coughs> established in 2012. Uh, another institute for social, economic, and political studies, which is led by people who used to work at President Putin's administration. A think tank, Rethinking Russia, which was again created with an idea of spreading information about Russia's parliamentary election and sending it to thousands and thousands of media outlets in the European Union member state. It was led by Volodin's protege Jan uh, Yaslavsky, replaced later by Alexander Kankov, who was a former and, uh, advisor and director of the Gorchikov Fund. Uh, in the sphere of foreign policy, we have several prominent think tanks. One of them is the Council for Foreign and Defense Policy, and its uh, supervisory board is made by several individuals connected to Russian security agencies like Andrei Bezrukov, who is a retired intelligence officer, Andrei Bagrov, uh, linked to Putin's Prony Patanin, Sergei Prilov, uh, and the TV channel Russia speaks for themselves, Vyacheslav Nikonov, executive director of the Ruski Mir Foundation, uh, Yuri Kabaladze is again former KGB official and deputy dean of Gimo's international media department, and Evgeny Kazokin is a Gimo's uh, vice director. Pretty well known in the West, uh, Russian International Affairs Council led by Andrei Kartunov. Uh, again, its board is represented by Putin aides, Gimo's director, Spirban president, executive director of the Kerchakov Fund, and its presidium. Again, it's led by a number of oligarchs, former uh, foreign ministers, uh, Putin's press secretary, deputy foreign minister, etc. 
I have to uh, underscore the very important role that is played in this by Lugimo and its uh, rector uh, Anatoly Tarkunov, who recently acknowledged that his university serves as an important channel of Russia's unofficial political dialogue with many countries. This is quote, uh, and that Lugimo's think tank Eurasian strategies which has been uh, established quite recently with, uh, by Tarkunov, uh, Vaslavsky, and journalist Evgeny Primakov, uh, grandson of a Russian former foreign minister, um, that it uh, actively engages the global network of GIMO alumni in solicitation of information, guidance, and promotion of Russian interests abroad. This has also a quote. For me, if we translate it in the common language, it sounds like they use GIMO graduates as um, unofficial intelligence gathering uh, officials. And that Maria Butina's story clearly demonstrated that the scope of Russian espionage, academic espionage, may be much larger than we previously believed, and that Russian intelligence has been recruiting students and professors since Soviet times, and that this pra practice is simply being continued in the present days. Uh, but importantly, uh, although the number of think tanks uh, in Russia may create the illusion of competing views and alternative visions, at a closer look, one may see that they consist of a rather narrow circle of propaganda narrative creators who are simply wearing different hats as either experts, CEOs, board members in various Kremlin-linked organizations. So when I looked at the composition of their leadership on the website and simply ticked the boxes, uh, I realized that you know, these key actors they all sit on all this Russian so-called uh, think tank community and just interchangeably uh, represent them in different, in different values. As I mentioned, there is a huge role played in this Russian propaganda machine by Russian oligarch. And let me just show you this side uh, about the Valdai Club, um, which is supported by several uh, richest uh, Russians. Alexei Mardashov is the second uh, man on Russia's Forbes list with a total asset of 18.7 billion dollars. Uh, he is a member of the Valdai support group. Again, Mikhail Friedman, Alpha Bank and Peter Aran. Renova Charity Foundation owned by Viktor Gexenberg. And Nikola Invest owned by Alisha Usmanov, the 10th richest uh, Russian with 12 billion uh, US dollars total wealth. But this list is not uh, exhaustive because um, there are also other people like Vladimir Yakunin, uh, Yevtushenko, Vlen Blavatnik, and others who have poured millions of dollars not only in the Valdai Club but also in Western think tanks and universities trying to establish closer uh, ties with them. So their dual objective is to strengthen the Kremlin's position internationally as well as to protect their personal business interests in light of the growing crisis in US-Russia or EU-Russia relations. But um, I have to underscore that this regime's kleptocratic uh, consensus and symbiosis with the oligarchs basically allows President Putin to use uh, business empires created by his uh, circle of oligarchs as ex extensions of the Russian government uh, and engage various non-state vehicles to promote state policies through seemingly independent, seemingly objective, non-affiliated and uh, credible agents of influence. Well, as you uh, know, in the last eight, five years, Russia has also invested millions into setting up its state-run institutions and foundations that are used as um, soft power organizations or as we call the Moscow's ideological subversion agencies. Those primarily are Rosa Trubuchistva, um, the Ruski Mir Foundation and the Karchakov Fund, which collectively have established numeral, numerous centers of Russian studies and Euro at European and American universities to promote Russia's cultural diplomacy and to broaden the network of Kremlin synthesizers within Western academia. Since I don't have the time, I cannot uh, demonstrate very specific uh, examples of how these uh, various foundations uh, uh, pursue their tactic. But let me uh, just again demonstrate that, for example, the Gorchakov Public Diplomacy Fund is again has several uh, oligarchs as members of its board of trustees, including Rikperov, Vartashov, 
Prohara, Gevtushenka, Karimov, Vladimir Yakunin. So we understand that this is not something that can be created sporadically. It doesn't make an impression to me, at least, you know, that all these individuals all of a sudden woke up one day and decided that it's time for them to establish something like the Korchakov public diplomacy plan. Um, probably this data is a bit outdated because um, my report, as I said, was dated October 2018, but back then Russia has already created 41 centers of Russian culture only in EU member states, including 27 of them at EU universities. Here is a list of all those schools, but fortunately the font is very small. Um, and again, let me quote Mr. Tarkunov, Gimo's rector, as uh, saying in one of his academic publications that the, United, the Soviet Union for a long time used higher education as a geopolitical tool and as an ideological weapon at the time of confrontation and the Cold War, long before the term soft power was coined, just thus encouraging the Russian government to simply follow the strategy that already had been pursued uh, by the Soviet Union. So uh, the second part of our study is how Russian oligarchs not only support various think tanks and uh, Russian soft power organizations in Russia, but how they try to export their ideas in the West. Um, and uh, the most well-known example, of course, is Vladimir Yakunin Center of Dialogue for Civilization the Institute in Berlin. By different account, accounts, he had invested from 27 to 30 million euro into uh, this center, which was first launched in Vienna and then moved to uh, Berlin. Uh, we know that uh, Vladimir Yakunin is a one-time KGB general and the former head of Russian railways. Um, he has been sanctioned in Russia, but even uh, in the wake of Russian EU sanctions, his uh, Institute managed to invite scholars from Princeton and Columbia to participate in various events hosted by Yakunin in Berlin. Um, Yakunin is also linked to the Institute for Democracy and Cooperation in, in Paris, which is led by Natalia Narachnitska. At a certain time, his uh, uh, probably colleague in, in New York, because both of them served in New York in the embassy and uh, Soviet embassy and um, the, the Soviet. Uh, representative office in the U UN, and uh, I found in the Russian press information that uh, Anatoly Kucherina is a famous uh, Russian lawyer. Vladimir Putin, the Vietnamese, in the 2012 and 2018 presidential election, have been coordinating the activities of the Institute for Democracy and Cooperation in Paris and New York. The New York office was led by Andranik Migranyan from the Kremlin. Uh, it would suffice to say that Anatoly Kucherina represented uh, Snowden when he uh, defected, uh, basically, state in the territory of Russia. Uh, yes, here is a very telling slide. You know, just recently, uh, despite all the um, controversy surrounding the Dialogue for Civilizations Institute, there was information that Vladimir, Put uh, Vladimir uh, Yakunin was invited to speak at one of the EU-funded conferences, and as has been uh, mentioned by this gentleman, to invite Yakunin to speak at a conference with the title Against the Nationalist Side. Uh, is like setting folks to keep the geese. I don't think that this should be a goal of EU's uh, strategic communication. Uh, of course, we can argue whether or not uh, the Union uh, Center in Berlin allows uh, Russia to achieve its uh, geopolitical goals, but this uh, slide is an indication that partially it did. Atlantic uh, UK and Global Bridge is one of the oldest soft power organizations in Berlin and I was uh, very surprised to learn that this year, for the first time in its history, it organizes a study tour uh, for its members, typically it's young professionals, scholars, journalists, to go to uh, Russia uh, and uh, to study, uh, uh, again I was shocked to read that, to study how Russia succeeds to be one of the, one of the strongest states in the world despite all the sanctions against um, Russian Federation. Again, we uh, know that Alexei Mordashov set up the Center on Global Interests in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mordashov is also a member of Alexander Kachikov's Public Diplomacy Fund and an official partner of the Valdai Club. Um, 
he uh, regularly invites former U.S. diplomat Thomas Pickering, who was from, who was an ambassador in Russia at some point of time, as a guest to various uh, conferences run, run by Gorchikov's fund. Uh, and uh, Pickering, together with uh, Luke Oil President Vagitari Pera, has received uh, Wilson Center's Corporate uh, Citizenship Award. The Center for uh, on Global Interest in Washington mm -hmm. is led by Nikolai Slobin, um, who is a co-author of the book The Russian Turn, together with Vladimir Solovyov, one of the most notoriously known Russian propagandists on Russia, one uh, TV channel. The most beautiful example of Russia's penetration of uh, Western academia is, of course, Viktor Gexelberg and his Renova Fortros Foundation, which has already invested 35, this is official information shared by uh, Vexilberg's foundation, 35 million on social investments in the United States, and here by social investments we mean organization of conferences, uh, renovation of museums uh, in the United States, etc. Uh, in 2012, in partnership with Chevron and two other Russian state-owned oil companies, Transneft and uh, Sorkin Flot, the Renova Group launched a joint conference called the Fort Ross Dialogue to encourage conversation and collaboration and the Fort Ross Dialogue was regularly attended by representatives of the Republican Party, high level representatives, senators, even congressmen, Republicans and Democrats, and uh, representatives of the Russian government. So again, this is not a demonstration of uh, sporadic uh, activities which are not even tied by the Russian government because you cannot uh, have a representative of your state in, in the face of a Russian Minister of Culture, Mijinsky, participating in this event and meeting with uh, American um, uh, politicians and government officials. Again, we know that uh, Wilson Center uh, has developed close relationship with various uh, programming oligarchs and these connections are dated back to 2005 and 2007 when uh, the Wilson Center awarded Corporate Citizenship Award to Vagitari Pera and in 2015, already in the week uh, of uh, deterioration of relations with, uh, between uh, the United States and uh, Russia, the Wilson Center gave its Corporate Citizenship Award to Peter Avin, who is cited on many pages of the Bueller Investigative Report where it had been confirmed that Peter Avin didn't act as an independent uh, messenger, that he worked uh, on Putin's orders and that his task was to make sure that the relationship between Russia and the United States are improved. Uh, finally, let me demonstrate this slide uh, about American citizen, uh, Ms. Lerman, who had established at the American University in Washington the Center for Russian Studies, the Lerman, Lerman Center, uh, a Cardinal Institute of Russian Culture and History, and who immediately after establishing this institution received several diplomatic awards from Nikola Sarkozy, from Russian Foreign Ministry, from the Wilson Center's Canon Institute, together with Peter Avin at the same event who been awarded this Corporate Citizenship Award. Uh, a year later she traveled to Kremlin where she received um, uh, an award directly from Putin. Um, and we know that this institute was led by uh, Mr. Fidashin, who is a son of a former Soviet KGB official state uh, who was placed in the UK and in the United States, and who was a lecturer in the Mgimo, and who, uh, whose whereabouts are currently unclear, because one of his uh, students, Maria Putina, as you know, is currently serving her 18 months prison state, uh, sentence in the United States. Clearly, uh, Russia is doing and uh, investing a lot into promoting its image of cultural superpower, and the country that I know best is the United States. Uh, here you see a very interesting invitation, one complimentary drink at the Washington National Opera at Kennedy Center. Uh, so everyone who attends um, just recently staged opera Yevgeny Onegin after a 30 year break, now again it is not a coincidence that uh, opera singers from St. Petersburg Opera come to Washington DC and spend half a year in Washington first staging the opera, that it is funded by again Lerman and the Russian government, and that not only you have a chance to listen to Russian opera again, but also drink, and this uh, uh, drinks are sponsored by Russian oligarchs, it's not, uh, it's not something that Americans serve to themselves. 
Um, and again, there is a new tour organized by the Russian Culture Ministry of the uh, Turetsky Choir on May 3rd. They sang uh, in Washington Mall, it was an open air concert. As part of the uh, European and global tour, they will be visiting 15 capitals in the EU, again promoting uh, the image of Russia as a, as a peace-loving state. Uh, and the title of this conference, uh, concert is Unity Songs. And again, uh, here is an example of a uh, think tank in Washington DC, again organizing uh, public events about Russian ballet and silencing uh, Russia's war crimes in Ukraine, for example, and not a single time organizing an event devoted to Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. Uh, the most recent example is another dialogue with Russia, which is a conference uh, held by Tufts University in partnership with Carnegie Endowment and the Gertrude Fund, again in Gimo. Uh, this uh, is the second time this conference is being organized. Again, it's a pretty, uh, I would say, a secretive event because uh, there is not too much information on the website. You cannot find even video recordings of these conversations. Uh, the program only uh, demonstrates very basic uh, subjects which have been covered by its participants. So, uh, combined, I believe, um, we are dealing with four groups of actors. And here is a quote that I particularly like from Julia Shevtsova, who said that um, those uh, four groups of actors who collectively advance pro-Putin narratives include the Russian experts who scream that the epoch of the West is over and that America should not be reckoned with. These are Western leaders like Schroeder, Berlusconi, Sarkozy, Chirac and others who whispered into the Russian president's ear what he wanted to hear. These are European leaders like Hungarian Prime Minister Orban who learned how to exchange pro-Kremlin rhetoric for gratuitous Russian assistance, and these are unfortunately Western intellectual gurus, journalists, and other public figures who, for Russian money, seek to convince the world that Russia has every right to feel hurt and is perfectly entitled to break windows in somebody else's house. So, what can be done in this situation? How this multi um, sometimes cooperation can be put under uh, some control? Well, probably, the, especially the U.S. government and European member states can consider um, one of the legislative mechanisms that was recently adopted by the United States government in relation to the Confucius uh, centers, the Chinese soft power institution. The government last August adopted the National Defense Authorization Act, which says that American universities can host and get partnership uh, with Confucius Institute uh, only if they um, stop receiving uh, state funding in support of the Chinese studies in the United States. So you have basically a choice. Either you take money from the Chinese government and then you cannot take American state uh, funding under this program or you uh, stay loyal to your state and you do not put yourself in a situation where these centers can be seen as elements of the Chinese propaganda. Uh, certainly, we should adopt mechanisms to safeguard integrity of our policies and practices. And we may even think about temporarily uh, freezing these cooperation programs with the uh, Ruski Mir Foundation, Rosa Trudnicistva, etc. And certainly, I would recommend updating our due diligence rules with respect to receipt of supposedly private funding from Russia, making it more transparent and ethical to prevent any forms of malign Russian influence through Kremlin-friendly oligarchs. Um, and again, let us not forget that there, are, there is, in my opinion, no such thing as independent um, think tank community in Russia these days, uh, especially those who are allowed to travel abroad, because I've heard numerous instances when Russian scholars were denied even the possibility of going uh, to the West upon invitation of uh, Western universities and Western think tanks, if they've been known for you know, voicing criticism of the regime or could be su suspected of voicing criticism abroad. We should be vigilant and mindful of covert Russian intelligence activities, remembering that FSB traditionally targets Western journalists, scholars, and forums, conferences, festivals, sporting events uh, held in Russia, and that often these uh, participants are put in all sorts of compromising situations which can later be used as blackmail against them. Thank you and I am ready to answer your questions. Hello, uh, 
I would like to ask two questions, and they are connected to each other. The first one. What are the connections between Russian think tanks and Alexander Dugin uh, and his ideas about Eurasian in Syria? And second one, do these think tanks recognize Dugin as authoritative author? Well, this is, this is a very specific question. I would uh, recommend you read Timothy Snyder's recent book, on The Road to Freedom, where he did the in detail narrates how Dugin was again Again, brought to Russia and um, how his philosophy is being used by the Kremlin and um, personally by Vladimir Putin. But I cannot answer the question, you know, how the Russian think tanks specifically quote him and quote him, because this is not the, the issue that I have studied in, in detail. I'm just um, wondering if you've also thought about the fact that a huge amount of influence um, uh, is exerted by the Kremlin, sort of directly and indirectly through the business communities. I what comes to mind I, is uh, uh, a gentleman who's the head of the Russian Direct Investment Fund, named Kirill Dmitriev, who is actually named in the Mueller uh, report about Russian interference in our elections as uh, as making contact with. Uh, several people who were connected to the to the Trump uh, campaign and organization and it's it, it seems to me that um, through these business ties they also overlap a little bit with the with the cultural uh, intellectual ties that you were discussing could you just comment on that yes 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 there is a part in my report where we discuss in detail uh, how this works in France, for example. So you probably know that Yakunin, he co-chairs the uh, Russian-France Business Council. So not only he funds and supports the activities of a think tank led by Ms. Narochnitska in, in, in Paris, but he also works in partnership with her representing the Russian business community in France. There are also other interesting fellows working with him, like Konstantin Molafiev, you probably know that this businessman who directly funded uh, the green, little green man in Crimea. He provided arms to so-called rebels in the east of Ukraine. Um, and there are other um, Russian banks, um, oil companies, um, oil steel companies, you know, who together not only host Russian cultural events, but lobby very aggressively uh, with the Russian, uh, with the French establishment trying to convince France as a, one of the key players, uh, not only in the EU, but as a part of the Minsk agreement process, you know, the Normandy format, to make sure that sanctions against Russia are being lifted. Uh, again, we can only uh, suspect, you know, and kind of wonder whether or not they, their activities are successful. But I'm afraid that we are now facing the moment of truth, especially with the change of power in Ukraine, uh, the change of uh, political situation in the United States with a new electoral cycle being very, very close. So I'm very much concerned that um, the European Union will consider softening its policies towards Russia and certainly the activities of think tanks and various business associations led by powerful players like Yakunin would not play the last role in this process. Well, thank you very much for your, for your speech, it was wonderful. Um, I just want to say I'm, a, I'm an employee of the uh, European Values Think Tank <laughs> and I appreciate what you said about the organization. I was just wondering if you'd be able to elaborate any connection between uh, pro-Kremlin think tanks and pro-Kremlin electoral observation groups and electoral observers, specifically uh, people who have appeared uh, in the East Ukraine kind of sham elections as well as uh, populist radical right uh, members who have appeared to uh, serve as experts for the Kremlin. Well, I must say that uh, fortunately Ukraine, which had been a testing ground for all those narratives by Russia. We often joke that the European Union and the United States can learn a lot from us, especially we noticed that during the Euromaidan revolution, Ukraine has clearly been a testing ground of all those false narratives on Facebook and other social media. So we now created a number of mechanisms which would allow us to offset 
the malign influence of various Russian think tanks and observers. You probably know this controversial decision that has been taken by the, the Ukrainian government to not allow Russian uh, observers to participate in the last uh, presidential elections exactly for the reason that you implied that they will be used as a political communicators of alternative reality uh, kind of narratives. Uh, you know, Ukraine has been criticized for this decision, which was seen by many international actors as being undemocratic. You know, we have to be open and transparent. And as some of our colleagues said yesterday, we cannot uh, copy Putin's um, strategies because we don't want to become little Putins ourselves. But nevertheless, I believe that there should be red lines, you know, which we shouldn't cross and that we have to defend ourselves. Otherwise, if we stay completely open and allow the enemy to, to enter our house on the pretext that we are Democrats, and, you know, and that is why we have to keep the doors to our house open, this poses a very big threat to our values and our institutions. And we have to be mindful of this um, Line activities and know how to protect them. Okay, one last question, Roman. Katerina, thank you. Um, congratulations. You, you and Ilya have obviously done an enormous amount of work putting together all this information, analyzing it all. This is really a very difficult area, and you referred just now to what Edward Lucas said yesterday about not tackling Putinism by you know, being little Putins our, our, ourselves. We're in a contest here between autocracy and democracy. And the very nature of democracies is that we are open and we're ready to have free speech and different views, even if they're views of our opponents and, and the autocrats. I'm sure that you or others could do an equally impressive analysis, for example, of British public diplomacy overseas. You could analyse how many um, offices the British Council has in other countries and other universities in other countries, the sort of um, activities that British corporations are, are, are doing to convince people to see things their way. You could even, dare I say, do an analysis of think tanks in London and find a small number of people sitting on the boards or important places in various of these think tanks. Now, does that mean that Britain is an autocracy? No, it doesn't. But there are certain ways in which states seek to exercise their, uh, their statecraft, their cultural diplomacy, their, their public diplomacy. So th 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 there's that issue. You're quite right to focus on what Russia has been doing, and not enough people understand that, and we need to understand that more clearly. But I think the line to draw is whether or not they uh, contravene our laws. And there are cases like the use of London as a money laundering centre where we have laws which we haven't been firm enough at applying. So we've got to be good at applying our laws. But if, for example, there's a Ruski Mir centre at St. Anthony's in Oxford or, or, or at, at the. There used to be. Uh, at, at Durham University at Edinburgh. Uh, that's not a good thing, but I don't think you can associate the whole of those universities with the fact that there may, there may be very small, as Elizabeth has just pointed out, there was for a while a risky mirror incident, but there isn't any more because there was publicity about it. So I think we really have to be careful in all of this, not to suggest that whole institutions in the West are acting on behalf of Russia. They're not. I exactly made this statement at the very beginning of my presentation, it said that typically this is a small unit which doesn't speak on behalf of the whole university, but nevertheless, to understand the whole scope of this activity by Russia, we need to, at least in numerical sense, understand what we are talking about. But you raised an extremely interesting issue about are we democracy, are we true democracies, or are we also starting to resemble autocracies in a certain way? Uh, when I presented this uh, study in the United States, one of their participants, um, who also a student scholar on Russia, she recommended that I study in a deeper, um, in greater detail the processes that are now taking place in the United States. I may recommend, if you are interested in understanding how 
uh, even domestically, some very wealthy American businessmen weaponize narratives, think tank narratives in the United States to read two recent studies by um, mayors, democracy, dirty, the dirty money, and by um, uh, the title is Democracy in, Chain, in Chains. So they started the Koch Brothers uh, Foundation, which collectively have established a network of think tanks, libertarian think tanks, and which fund more than 1,000 scholars in the United States and academic centers, all in the, with a name to um, peddle uh, policies, state policies that would benefit them personally as businessmen who are involved in oil business, as, as you know. Uh, so is it a democratic process? Well, certainly it is, because they support civil society, but civil society which no longer represents the true essence, you know, the true meaning of civil society. It is just disguised lobbyists <laughs> who work with senators and congressmen trying to ensure that they adopt the legislation on uh, tax waivers for the richest uh, people uh, in the United States. Because the Koch brothers, they are number eight and nine, I believe, on the U.S. Forbes list. They are the wealthiest people in, in the world. So imagine the, the Cato Institute is, is one of the uh, most well-known think tanks that they have established, which works for their private agenda. So are they better than Mr. Putin, who is kind of opening his think tanks in Berlin? It's just the same strategy which makes me think that uh, we have to reconsider the role of think tanks nowadays and probably change our legislation that governs these institutions, demanding full disclosure of funding, uh, demanding full, full disclosure of who is behind and upon whose request this conference roundtable being organized. And when we have this information fully disclosed, we will then judge whether it, has a, whether it is a bona fide academic event or whether it is a disguised kind of lobbying uh, event which we attempt without even knowing that we as scholars have been manipulated you know, and are used uh, for someone's uh, private uh, state interest. Okay, thank you thank very you. much, Karthi. Thank you. The good news is that there is no oligarch behind the organization of this one.